Okay, let's get back to the sessions at hand. Ladies and gentlemen, India will need investments worth 50 to 60 billion dollars to meet the demand of a billion trips every year across 200 airports. Now the next session on airports of the future and building great aviation businesses focuses on how CEOs will need to hire top talent in order to stay ahead of various disruptions that are impeding growth in the aviation sector in our country. This session will now explore the need of developing and modernizing aviation infrastructure. I'm going to play for you a video that will lead into the session. Ladies and gentlemen, attention to the screen. Well, here comes the session, Airports of the Future and Building a Great Aviation Business. I'd like to invite on stage the moderator of this session, Mr. Stephen Beatty, Head of Global Infrastructure, Americas and India, KPMG. Good afternoon and welcome. I'd also like to invite the panelists of this session, Mr. Takeshi Murauka, DG Natural Disaster Prevention, Civil Aviation Bureau, Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, Japan. Welcome. With him, the interpreter. I'd also like to welcome on stage Ms. Winsome Lenfert, Deputy Associate Administrator, FAA. Warm well, welcome to you too. Ms. Angela Gittins, Director General, Airports Council International. Good afternoon and welcome to you too. Mr. Jeff Poole, DG Council. Please join us on stage. Good afternoon. Mr. Julian Coffinier, Managing Director, Asia Pacific Group ADP. Warm welcome to you too. Mr. Gotthard Berger, Director, Strategy at Harris Orthogon GmbH. Good evening. Mr. Alexandre de Juniac, Director General, International Airport Air Transport Association. Warm welcome to you too. His Excellency, Mr. Akbar Al Bakr, GCEO, Qatar Airways. Very warm welcome to you. Good afternoon. And Mr. Daniel Bircher, CEO of Zurich Airport, Asia. I now hand this over to the Honorable Moderator of the session.
we win the largest panel award, and I'm going to win as long as I can finish on time. And apparently there's a rather large hook that's going to come and get us. Um, the challenges associated with very rapid and unprecedented growth are immense. And some of the challenges are staying in sync. Other challenges are making sure that we keep pace with technology. Um, and my panel itself doesn't need an introduction, but I would ask as we go through that you understand we have representatives from all facets of the, of the sector. Uh, first question uh, to Alexandre. Um, as DG of IATA, could you give us a bit of an indication of the airline's perspective on what needs to be done to ensure that we've got enough capacity in the right increments and at the right time? Um, thank you for asking me the question. So what has to be done is uh, several things. First of all, make the right decision at the right time to build the capacity, uh, whether it's in airport or air traffic control. Uh, secondly, invest in the right technology. We have a lot of programs, you know, to uh, optimize the, 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 uh, the current infrastructure. To give you an example, we, we, we have a program to speed up uh, the, the flux of people on the ground in the, in the security system, which is a pain for everyone, uh, so let's, let's face it. Um, we, um, thirdly, um, we use uh, digitalization in airlines, you know, to uh, dramatically enhance the relation with the customer to be able to customize the offer, to know him better, to propose him the right, you know, the right um, product or service. And um, so that's uh, the third point. And um, fourth, uh, we, we ask all governments to create the right conditions for the aviation to develop lower cost, uh, invest in technology, facilitate uh, the the uh, the barriers or lift the barriers for for administrative or um, cost barriers everywhere. So that's where we are pushing. It's a it's a very interesting and vexing problem to make sure that we stay in balance. And the challenge of economics, the challenge of facilities, is very very uh, difficult to get right, particularly when things come the capacity increments are very large. And I, I sympathize completely with your, with your statements. Um, Angela, from the airport's perspective, what, what changes do you see as necessary in how we evolve to meet the capacity challenges of the future? I think we have to I think we have to recognize that we can't keep doing things the way we've been doing it. Uh, we estimate that uh, traffic will, uh, demand, passenger traffic demand will double in the next 15 to 17 years, depending on whose forecast you want to use. We can't double the number of airports around the world. We can't double the number of runways. You know, we can't double the infrastructure. Um, so we have to use it better. I mean, yes, we will need more infrastructure, uh, particularly in places like India, um, but everywhere in the world is going to have to make changes, uh, make the use of technology, you know, let technology work for us, not against us, so that we become more efficient, have better utilization. I would say uh, that more countries need to do what India is doing, which uh, developed an aviation plan, um, put on the table what its uh, vision is, uh, and set out to try to uh, realize that vision. Uh, we can't just keep doing things in an ad hoc way, the way aviation has grown. And that goes for the countries uh, that are going to have this huge growth, like India, but it also goes for mature markets like the US, uh, and Western Europe. Uh, so we're all going to have to work together more, and I know we always say that, but it's becoming more and more critical to work together to share information and to work in partnership because we're all going to strangle uh, if we don't. Particularly if any one element becomes radically out of sync with others. 
That's right. It all has to stay in balance. So, you know, and not just at the airport, you know, in the sky, on the ground, people have to be able to get to and from the airport as well. So, uh, you, you know, we can only go as quickly as the slowest part of the system. Jeff, um, that then poses the, the question to you. For everything that happens in the air, as DG can, so how, how, how does that factor in? All right, thank you. Um, well, I, f I find myself in the very unusual position of having to agree, agree entirely with both Alexandra and Angela at the same time. Um, uh, and it's, in, it's, important to, it's important to understand that air traffic management is the invisible part of the, of, the, of the aviation chain. And that has meant that it sometimes suffered in terms of the investment. You know, you, there's a lot of investment goes into airports and airlines, but not necessarily into air traffic management. But that's vital as, as we're, we're going into a more cohesive type of aviation now, where the emphasis will be on managing the flight from A to B, not handing an aircraft over from one service provider to another uh, on its international, uh, an international journey. And it's an air, air traffic management is, is very exciting at the moment because of all of the things we've been talking about at this conference. The technology is coming in, uh, the impact of um, unmanned uh, vehicles and, and so on. And that technology is really going to transform air traffic management, whether it's through the space-based surveillance or most importantly, digitization. Um, people were talking this morning about remote towers. Well, that's, that's all possible because of digitization. And digitization in air traffic management breaks air traffic management down into much more of a commodity and makes the service more important than the provider. Um, and there I think you're gonna see a, a lot of change in the way that things are done. But I, but I can only agree with my colleagues about the need for having the right sort of uh, regulatory framework, uh, facilitate, facilitating all of that rather than standing in the way of it. And, and I think most importantly, I think as well, recognizing that people still have a very, very important part to play in everything we do in future. Great. Um, Winsome, um, airports are dynamic environments and subject to all kinds of external shocks. Um, where should CAAs focus in order to uh, ensure that we achieve the potential to which we are bound? So a lot of it starts with good planning um, and looking at what that future looks like um, and at multiple horizons, so five years, 10 years, 20 years. And that has to look at it from a national perspective, from like a system plan, all the way down to the individual um, airports plan. And as you develop those plans, the important part is to invest in all your stakeholders. And that includes the airlines, the concessionaires, the folks that run the airports, um, the aircraft manufacturers, what type of technology they have coming, um, maintenance personnel, and involving even the communities. Because it's important to involve all of those stakeholders so that an airport can withstand um, not just technology pressures, but also political pressures. And so that you're developing something that is incremental, that can withstand time, and that can withstand changes in priorities. And so if you take it from an incremental approach and looking at it from a longer term perspective, I think it will help uh, withstand and continue success. But you've just defined how to achieve the impossible, <laughs> how to balance all of those stakeholders' interests in a very public forum with different users and different consumers continuously agitating that they should, their interests should come first. So it's not going to be an easy path, is it? It never is. But you've got to try. Because if not, you won't see success. Yes. Well, we'll come back to something that I think is really important. We spend an awful lot of time talking about the present, and one of, one of my observations about this event is, is we've really well captured the today of India. The challenge is, is how do we capture the tomorrow of India and make sure that the technological set, and this is happening across multiple industries simultaneously, all of the economics courses that we all took in, in university and college assumed a fixed technological set. And in the next 20 years, we're going to see a massive change 
in the technological set that confronts and facilitates the, uh, the operation of the aviation system. Um, Your Excellency, from the perspective of a global airline and decision making, could you give us a little insight into how airlines make decisions and the implications of airport capacity, air system capacity in terms of route profitability and how you choose to serve a market or not? Uh, so you want to know about the secrets how we conduct our business? Exactly. Okay. I have uh, a lot of airline colleagues here, so I have to be careful how much I give out. We, we, when we, as we are a hub and spoke airline, when we decide on uh, how we need to choose the routes, we go into the MIDT and we look at where are the passenger flows and to which destinations that we would like to operate or to which uh, uh, cities we would like to operate which is not properly connected and these passenger floors that are going through have to do multiple stops or where we see we can start launching the routes where we could cut the travel time significantly. And this is where we start deciding on which routes we are going to launch and when we are going to launch and which routes will complement the routes that we are already operating. But also, sometimes we go with intuition. For example, when we launched Cardiff, when we launched Seychelles, when we launched uh, Chiang Mai, there are several cities which my corporate planning told me that if we launch these routes, we may not perform uh, as we want to perform, and we have other priorities. And of course, me as a CEO, I have to overrule sometimes my planning people and direct them to the routes I think would be very beneficial to our network. And we have, uh, not 100 times, but at least uh, 95 times correct. So this is how we, we decide on how we will structure our network. And in this, uh, Qatar Airways has been very successful. We have created markets. Gothenburg is uh, the last, destinations, last destination that we launched. Again, the forward bookings are extremely strong. This city is unconnected with the international network. So if you want to go from Gothenburg to anybody, this is the second city in Sweden, you would have to go to some inefficient hubs in uh, Europe, or you would need to go to Stockholm to make at least one or two stops before you are going to a destination that there is, we see is, uh, is a good opportunity. And in this, uh, again, we were right. Uh, so this is how we normally would, uh, would structure our network. So there is obviously a science to it, but then there's also an art. Of course. It is not just, uh, you know, uh, you don't, uh, as a group chief executive of a major airline, you don't sit uh, in your office and behind uh, your diary you start writing destinations you want to operate. There is a lot of work that goes into it. And uh, it also uh, sometimes depends on the aircraft manufacturers, how quickly they can uh, give me the, uh, the aircraft. You know, an, uh, an aeroplane manufacturing process is not a chocolate factory. So sometimes you have to, uh, to wait, and sometimes you are at the mercy of uh, the BFE providers, because what again has not happened in our industry, all the aircraft manufacturers, Airbus, Boeing, Bombardier, Embraer, uh, now of course uh, uh, our friends in China who are now into aircraft manufacturing, uh, are relying on the same supply chain. And there will be a time, I know that uh, 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 my dear friend, uh, uh, Mr. Chobe has announced that they will be uh, in introducing nearly 1,000 more aircraft. Uh, China has uh, only in the, uh, the airline that we have just uh, invested, have nearly uh, uh, 600 more aircraft in the pipeline and so and so forth, the, they are all relying on the same supply chain. And the supply chain is not investing to, in order to produce more. So what is going to happen that we as airlines are all going to face problems where we will have delays in uh, delivering our airplanes because uh, 
uh, the, uh, the supply chain is completely saturated and there is no new investment. So we have supply constraints in airports, supply constraints in air navigation, supply constraints in aircraft manufacture. But we have a lot of capacity at uh, Doha Airport, so if airlines want to operate, they are most welcome. <laughs> Very good, very good. Um, Daniel, you were an early participant, or Zurich Airport was an early participant in India. You've since disposed of your interest in Bangalore. Um, and you're looking at other opportunities in Asia. What do you look for in an opportunity in an airport uh, as you're looking, you're looking to decide to invest or to pursue investment in that airport? Yeah, you were right. We were reasonably early, and I think uh, the, the things that you look at have changed. I can remember when we started, we had a discussion with the government uh, officials because we were discussing how much space we would have in the waiting area for commercial setups, and he said, look, uh, you don't need anything else than seats and a bottle of uh, water dispenser. So now, if we look what we were looking at at this stage and what we look at today, it's different. And I think the outmost important part for us is the, the regulatory environment. So uh, stable regulatory conditions, concession conditions that are foreseeable, uh, that you are in a position to assess what are the risks, because there is enough risks investing in, uh, in uh, countries in Asia, uh, be it from a demographic point of view, be it from a technology point of view, but I think the, the, the least manageable risks or political risks are regulatory changes. So I think that is something which is, uh, which is for an airport operator important, and together with this uh, aspect, obviously the economic regulation is one of the key factors to look at. If I take now the example of India, that requires all these investments, Obviously, a dual-till approach is the best model there for an investor because there is a lot of investments required. And uh, if you want a reasonable payback for these investments here, then uh, it's not uh, the best model if you have to cross-subsidize that with commercial uh, aspects uh, and mix these two things. So, but I think India has adopted a, 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 pra a pragmatic approach which will enable uh, future investments uh, in the country. Well, it's interesting because we'll come back to that. One of, the, one of the questions that I'll have for the panel at large is how do we deal with low-cost airports today, low-volume airports today, and as they mature over the next 20 years, what does that imply in terms of physical quality, physical requirements, as well as the cost of service? But we'll come, we'll come back to that. Qatar, can, can you give us a, a view as to how you would consider managing supply and demand and ensuring that from an air nav scheduling perspective you can keep things in balance yeah thanks for the question um we see in the traffic row that there's a more and more need to combine airport operation with air traffic control operation um in a lot of situations in the past we see both operations being not entirely disconnect but not fairly really collaborative um, and recently um, ACI supports the initiative uh, also Kenso in introducing airport CDM so most of the airports are now starting with airport CDM and here's where the journey starts in collaboration between airports and and ATC operation but providing uh, more information when flights are going to depart from airports you will have a demand on ATC what are the available capacities on the sectors at the destination airports and we see more and more regulation uh, in in the past in, in Europe and the US and, and nowadays we are starting to discuss how we can regulate the traffic in in, uh, in the APEC region so Collaboration between airports and, and ATC does not only mean to provide better data to ATC, it's also vice versa, providing better data from ATC to the airport. It's a crucial information when flights going to land. And I'm not talking about 10 minutes before landing or 20 minutes, we are talking about two, three, four hours. This impacts significantly, A, environmental things like the uh, um, uh, fuel burn, but it also has operational cost from the airline perspective. So for me, 
the next step, the most important step that we are going to, to have to do is to make the journey that we have started with Airport CDM that we further move on in linking airport operation into the network operation of ATC to really make sure that we have the right capacities available at the right time so that especially airline operators can benefit from this collaborative approach. Now, now Julian, when, when you think in terms of, let's say, the physical, the use of technology and the capital finance of airports, how do we make sure that we mix those elements together effectively to create the capacity necessary to meet demand? Thank you, Stefan. Uh, at the end of the day, we need to start to be innovative from day one. It's when you sink the airport, once you have identified the land. You need to be innovative to welcome these new technologies when you design the airport. Because as an airport investor or financial investors, we invest for 30 or 50 years. We will invest during the next three to five years billions of USD. So you cannot change with a disruptive ID 10 years after your airport. So you need to be innovative. Just an example of innovation. You need to bring flexibility to your airport to adjust to the new technologies, to the new ideas and innovation in the coming years. For instance, Group ADP designed the new Beijing Airport, Daixing Airport. This is the first time, one of the first times, that we will have six different levels. Two for arrivals, two for departures, and two for offices and technical. Then you can change between domestic and international when the mix of the traffic will change. You can also bring some innovation you know, to face those challenges by using some new tools simulation tools, virtual reality, increased reality, to sync and to help decision makers at the state level to help them make the best decision for the airport. And then uh, when it comes to uh, financing, because it's also a big part uh, in order to, uh, to make reality uh, an airport, I must say that there is not much innovation in financing. You're still in concrete. You're building something which is concrete, and lenders are lending money, just like they used to lend money 10 years ago with project finance. But we need that. It's clear. So in terms of capital uh, financing, I would just add one thing. There is a new trend, which is also the future of the airport. Lenders are more and more demanding in terms of compliance, of course, but they also want to be sure that the airport operator, the airport investor, is developing sustainable, with sustainability the airport, being, uh, having values to accompany the development of all stakeholders, the neighborhood, the territories around the airport. And this is how you can make uh, an airport a success when everybody is around the airport, not only the users, are part of this ecosystem. Because an airport, at the end of the day, is a system of systems. It's, it's interesting because when, when you describe it, the, the finance business views an airport almost as a single asset. And really, as, we're, as we look at it and we start to look at it over the long term, that approach actually creates a structural rigidity in the, the ability to add capacity. And if, as we view regulation, Regulation will increasingly become part of the equation that allows flexibility to enter, to enter in and allows a long-term sustainable model to be developed. Much of project finance doesn't allow that in today's, in today's model. I, I think just one point on regulation. Why do we have regulation? We have regulation to avoid monopoly situation. So this is necessary regulation. Then there will be this endless debate between shall we have a single till, dual till, we have hybrid till. In Paris, we have adjusted till. So at the end of the day, it's just a question of uh, a trend that uh, a, a French, uh, a German, an Indian government will have to give uh, to the uh, airport regulation. And what, why do we need regulation? It's also because thanks to regulation, we can finance the airports. Lenders are lending money because they have visibility on how the tariff will increase or decrease. It may happen. Yes. Well, and regulation to protect both the regulated and the user. Mr. Morocca, as, as Director General for Natural Disaster Pro 
protection in Japan um, with, with the Civil Aviation Bureau. The, the Kansai Airport in the last year has been, has been hit by a very powerful uh, typhoon. Uh, this is an airport built in the sea, so the impact must have been massive. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about the incident and how Japan responded to the challenge and how it's responding or planning to respond to future? Yep. Well, um, as for the damage of the airport uh, last September, uh, the strong typhoon hit the West Japan and as you said, the Kansai International Airport located offshore was severely damaged by the tidal waves. A part of the bank protection collapsed by the high tide and wave. And unfortunately, pumps to drain the flooded water at the airport also lost the function. So consequently, half of the airport island was severely flooded, including airport terminal buildings. And uh, thanks to tireless efforts by persons concerned, one of the two runways was restored just three days after the attack by the typhoon. Another runway was also uh, restored 10 days after the hit. Considering this uh, devastating damages of the airport, Civil Aviation Bureau of Japan, Japanese government, has established a committee the aim of this committee is to reconsider the fundamental principle to maintain the aviation network and to, rescue, uh, to secure the airport functions, even in the case of the massive natural disasters. The committee published an interim report last month. There are three uh, major points. First one is uh, the report concluded that uh, it's very crucial to take uh, measures against natural disasters, both in terms of in hard infrastructure and uh, associated soft aspects. Natural disaster can be protected by hard infrastructure, of course, but a disaster could exceed the capacity of the hard infrastructure. So uh, this report emphasizes that importance to formulate overall business continuity plan which requires to establish a collaborative actions of various concerned entities at each airport. And actual drills of the BCP should be carried out frequently. In addition, uh, the government is also expected to take appropriate responsibilities even at the airports operated by the private sector. So, um, these are our experience and uh, lessons from the disasters. So I hope this uh, experience would be a good lesson for the uh, development of the Indian airport. Thank you, thank you. Alexandre, we've, we've seen significant changes or significant evolution in origin destination um, pairs in India. We've seen significant evolution in um, technology how, how do we make sure that we respond to the demand that we can't see yet? Um, the demand from the, um, as His Excellency um, allowed, from places that, don't, that aren't obvious. Um, how do we make sure we meet, we as the infrastructure providers, meet your needs as the airlines? Um, the best, we, we, we think that the best way for a government or a country to uh, to meet the expectations and to answer the demand uh, is to be able to build a national aviation plan, kind of national aviation strategy. Um, so it means that we, we, we encourage government and the government of India has done a very good job in that respect in designing the 2040 you know, objective for India um, because it aligns you know, the various interests um, towards the same objective. We have asked, we are uh, in another part of the world, in Europe, we are asking state by state, uh, each government to, to uh, set up a national airspace strategy also to align all the interest with another purpose is to have, um, to push the single European sky forward, which is still yes. another, yes. Uh, uh, another objective. But 
having a plan at the national level decided by the highest political authorities, um, fixing the right objectives, aligning the interests, that's, we think, the first key step. And it's not very frequent. Sometimes we have bits and pieces, but they are not designed and integrated in the consistent plan. So, so the, the Indian national plan is actually quite unusual in its explicitness. Um, are, there other, are, are there other countries that you would highlight as having good plans or having communicated effectively? I will tell you, I speak under the control of uh, my, my chairman who is there, but you know, his country, Qatar, has, has had a national uh, aviation strategy for years. Successful. Effectively communicated, taking into account the needs of all and being responsive and setting the agenda. Angela, how do you see low-cost airports evolving? Um, we've heard a lot about low-cost. We've heard a lot about 100 low-cost airports or thereabouts. How do, they, how do you see them evolving over time? And what do you see consumer demand doing as national income rises and personal disposable income rises? first ask do you mean airports that are designed to ac to accommodate low-cost carriers or are you talking about the more remote or airports in remote locations which need to be at the lowest possible cost in order to uh, uh, satisfy the market that it serves I, I think initially in India I'm talking about both simultaneously um, recognizing that Yields are very slim in India, so we're dealing with low cost at the same time. Yeah, with respect to uh, tr uh, trying to build airports for the low cost carrier market uh, is a very uh, kind of treacherous uh, situation because business models can change, and we've seen that uh, with various airlines uh, and at various airports uh, that have tried to customize its infrastructure for a particular business model of a carrier and then either the carrier goes away or the carrier changes its business model and as we've discussed it's not that easy to change your infrastructure around. Uh, we also have to recognize that although the carrier uh, may have a certain business model that doesn't mean its passengers have that same business model. Uh, so we saw at one airport, for example, that, that uh, built a, um, it was a purpose-built terminal for a, a low-cost carrier, but its passengers wanted the same amenities that the passengers of a, of a, um, uh, a, a full-service carrier. Uh, and so it was a failure. Uh, and they actually had to tear it down and, and, and start over. So the airport, the owner, has to think of kind of its market basics and look at the true end user, which is the passenger or the shipper, not just the customer that's sitting in front of them, which is the airline. And I guess in the context of India, with massive growth in personal disposable income and significant changes, over the next 20 years, we're really going to see a change in customer expectations and customer expectations. Well, that's right. And I think customer service really needs to be kept in mind no matter what the uh, kind of the, uh, the amenities of the, of the airport are. Uh, it could be very basic and very f and, and purely functional, just you know, the safety and security uh, uh, to be taken care of. But that doesn't mean a lower level of customer service. And so you always have to uh, track what your passengers needs, expectations, and uh, perceptions are of that airport. And I think that's, that will keep you in better stead and, uh, and signal to you when you need to upgrade the offerings uh, in your facility. And I guess another, another example would be security and the implications of security at both 
um, full service airports and low cost, you can't just do half a job in a low cost airport and low cost facility. Well, the, the security um, 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 consequences and the security provisions have to be the same. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't do you any good to have low security at one airport and then the passengers go to another airport and uh, you know, now there's security, but um, you, you know, if you've had a problem, you've already had the problem. But in a, but in a space constrained environment, that can be a massive change and really transform the ability to deliver customer service if all of a sudden the in have a significant increase in the amount of space that has to be devoted to security um, for both passengers and for baggage and cargo. Yeah, but this goes back to what I said, that, that you, we're thinking of how we've always done this. And uh, one hopes that we will be able to use technology, processes, uh, risk bases to, uh, to reform and adapt the security uh, measures uh, to the risks and, and to the ability to find what we need to find. Great. So, so I don't think we should, I don't think we should kind of stay in the mode we are in now where security is taking up a great deal of space and perhaps it doesn't need to take up as much space. So technology and technological evolution in that regard could actually be a significant enhancer from today's models. Yeah, and when I say technology, I'm not just talking about um, the technology for finding uh, dangerous goods. It's also the technology with respect to assessing risk. And I think that's an area, I, and I know there's, there's work being done around the world in that. It's an area that uh, needs to, uh, to, to really um, uh, go deeper. And I think that's, that's something that our future is going to depend on greatly. Uh, because again, you, you can't just keep putting machines all over airports and try to find the, the next thing that the bad guys are going to be uh, uh, putting at their disposal. So enhancements in both efficiency and effectiveness. Jeff, in that, in that regard, um, air navigation is going to see a massive transformation over the next 20 years. Can you give us a little insight into the things that you think are, we're going to see? Not necessarily um, program one or program two or something like that, but just the, the, the areas where you see significant potential for change over the next 20 years? Um, it's, a, it's a big question, but I think it, it's all coming through the new, the new technologies, basically. That's what's going to be transforming air traffic management. I mentioned some of those this morning. Um, the uh, space-based surveillance systems that will allow tracking and control of aircraft uh, and avoiding the need for ground-based infrastructure su such as radars. Um, you've got uh, digitized towers, not just the remote ones, but the main ones in cities. Um, you have system-wide information management, a much greater use of, of data. All of that is going to lead to greater efficiency in air traffic management and will enable management of flights globally, as I mentioned earlier, rather than just you know, from one air navigation service provider to the next to the next. And that should improve the efficiency for, for, for airlines. I mean, because at the end of the day, I think we're, we're all working for airlines and ultimately the passenger to make that, um, that comfort. So we're already seeing uh, significant improvements in uh, air traffic flow management. Um, with uh, on, a, on, a, on arrival planning and things like that. So, you know, tonight I'm flying from uh, Mumbai to Amsterdam. Well, in the future, you know, that will be that, that whole flight will be controlled. So there was no point in me taking off from Mumbai unless the slot is available um, to arrive in Amsterdam and everything can work seamlessly. Um, we always talk about the need for seamless uh, airspace. Um, but it's going to be our underlying processes and technologies that, that are going to be seamless first to enable all, all of that to happen. So, you know, I think all of that will change, but we have got to get our act together um, to enable all of that. Um, that means that air navigation service providers have to be able to act like normal businesses, um, to be able to invest in the new technologies, to be able to form different types of business arrangements with different partners, 
uh, to, make, to make all of this happen. So we talk about the challenges of growth, but we're actually the problem in, in many ways. And um, I, I agree with Alexander's uh, answer. You know, you start with everybody's got to have the same vision, strategy, and planning. It's a nonsense when airlines, airports, and air navigation service providers all start with different market forecasts for the same place. So it's bringing all of that together as well. And I think, so the transformation through technology, but the transformation, I think, through, through partnership between different parts of the industry is going to be fundamental. So it's both the technology and the actors using the technology. Exactly. Now, when we were preparing for uh, our, our panel, um, I was all busily working away thinking about 20-year horizons, 30-year horizons, and longer. And, and Winsome pulled me up short. And she said, hey, wait a minute, what about the 10-year horizon? Because the challenge of getting to 20 involves also getting to 10. And, and maybe, Winsome, you can give us some insight in the shorter-term issues, what I'll call the medium-term issues that we've got to get through before we maybe can embrace our grand vision. So even today, um, a lot of airports are facing just construction. If you look at many of our airports out today, some of them are air traffic control systems. Even some of the older ones are facing, they're 30, 40, 50 years old, needing maintenance. Our runways also, um, a lot of them are military age, um, were inherited. Um, and so where you have a lot of folks trying to look at that grand view of that beautiful new um, architectural design terminal that they want to build in the next 20 years, sometimes it's just maintaining the runway you have out there today. And then making it a terminal changes that can take you into the next 20 to 30 years. And so from an airport's perspective, it's constantly that balanced perspective of how do we, how do we maintain the airport we have today? And then taking it through that 5, 10, 15, 20 year perspective, and then sometimes our concessionaires, we have even 50 year agreements. And so how do we balance that future of the airport and the needs of the community? So it's very difficult. Um, a lot of times, I've, you know, talking with Angela and everybody here, it's how do you, how do you use technology, how do you diversify, um, and then the multiple size of airports. First of all, what are you trying to be when you grow up? You know, are you a general aviation airport? Are you that short haul um, tier two, tier three airport? Are you a tier one airport? And then what are you gonna be able to do to sustain that market? And then be able to balance not only your growth, but how to ensure that you have maintenance on that airport to be the best airport you can be today. So it, again, it's, it's taking into the effect of you know, what are your financial resources? Are you using your land for non-aeronautical development? Are you advancing your cargo market? Are you taking advantage of your business aviation and, and, and really using the strengths of your other industries that surround your community? Um, what type of airlines are you using? And, and then how do you negotiate your rates and charges? And then how do you partner with that private investment? So using all of that to build the airport that you need and maintaining it. And so it's tricky. It goes back to that, you know, sounds like we're trying to create world peace here um, when you're bringing all of those people together. But the bottom line is to ensure that we provide a good resource as an economic driver for our communities. We advance our communities so that they're open to the world and they can bring in those folks and then simple transportation. And so we all have, and then in the end, our business partners are trying to make a profit. So how do we balance all those, those needs? And it starts with listening to each other. It starts with understanding what our needs are, what our drivers are, and then trying to figure out what that agreement is and moving forward. And I guess in the, in the case of, of the Indian marketplace, the demand pressures that are going to be faced over the next five years create a much greater commonality of interest than might otherwise be possible in lower growth markets. Um, Julien, can you give us a, a, a view, your view on how we deal with low traffic airports, particularly from a regulatory perspective, and how we ensure financial viability today and financial viability in the future 
when demand has really evolved. Thank you. Uh, there is no mag magic trick. Unfortunately, and under the control of Angela, who published uh, one year ago a study about that, under one million passengers, usually, an airport is not profitable. So do not expect private players, private sector, to invest in an airport which has a low traffic, which is below one million passengers. Uh, an airport is offering a public service in order to connect different airports together. Connectivity is productivity. So the more you connect, the more productivity you will get. So the only, one of the only solutions in order to increase and enhance the connectivity and then the productivity of a low traffic airport would be to organize a bundle of airports. This is where the private sector will be ready to finance. You have, let's say, a profitable engine, and then the rules of the game are clear. You also invest in small airports. This is what Group ADP do, do, did during 15 years in Mexico with 13 regional airports. We know that the Japanese government is organizing also currently uh, uh, a privatization of seven airports in Hokkaido, of which one is highly profitable, two are break-even, and four are unprofitable. But at the end of the day, the consolidated is profitable. So bundling airports is a solution, and it for the moment is a key solution in order to uh, enhance low traffic airports and develop them, because it will bring synergies. And I think, unfortunately, that's it. Huh? I do not see any other magic trick to uh, develop a uh, uh, low traffic airport by the private sector. Okay. Um, and I've just received a note that the clock down there is wrong and that we have five minutes. Um, none of us can see the clock, because that's why I stood up. I mean, it says 13 minutes, but we have five minutes. So, Your Excellency, a very quick question in terms of your view of the Indian marketplace from the perspective of a global carrier. Uh, I have always mentioned that I have a, a huge uh, admiration for what is happening in the aviation landscape in India. Uh, as uh, the speakers, after speakers already mentioned, the potential of the Indian market and the growth that it will face over the next uh, several years to become one of the largest aviation markets in the world. But uh, there are going to be challenges to achieve that. First and foremost, Uh, there is an impressive growth of uh, 22% as was stated over the last four years in the growth of the aviation market in India. But the aviation growth should not only be focused internally. You should also see what is going to be the growth of Indian uh, 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 market from overseas. Overseas uh, growth is equally important as is the domestic growth because it is the, the international traffic growth that will bring huge, huge contribution to G GDP. But unfortunately, the, the, the overseas uh, growth is already saturated due to the uh, very strict traffic rights regime of the, uh, the, the Indian government. It is now time that uh, the, the overseas growth potential should also be realized, which will not only see the growth in the GDP, but also will massively grow the, the employment opportunities uh, to, the, uh, to the Indian people, but at the same time will give the best value for money that you are generating in the domestic in, uh, increase in traffic also from the overseas arrivals into India, because when you just calculate the Indian diaspora that is living outside, are now having difficulty to communicate back to their home country at the times that they require, because there is no more traffic that is left to be utilized by international carriers. I know that uh, maybe what I'm saying, I may be accused that I'm looking at it from the uh, prism of uh, 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 an overseas carrier. But that is a fact. Whenever you speak to any overseas carrier, my colleagues, when I speak to them in meetings at IATA, every single airline always mentions that the problem is that we cannot really 
uh, contribute to the Indian growth potential from the perspective of foreign carriers. And you know, this whole uh, growth story is a chicken and egg story. Each one of us, in domestic and foreign carriers, contribute to each other. So you can imagine if this growth of 22% year on year also happens from international carriers into India, you can see that it is not only going to take another five or 10 years uh, for India to become the largest uh, 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 aviation market, it will, it will actually expedite uh, to put India into that high category of the world's largest aviation market. You already, uh, the, the Honorable Minister of Civil Aviation mentioned uh, that uh, railways, for example, carried eight billion people, nearly seven times the population of India. You can also translate, not that much, but in that category also for aviation market to grow in India because a lot of people who are now in the category of uh, the world's largest middle-class population in India would also be able to benefit from this easy market access to foreign carriers. Thank you. Mr. Moroka, one final question to you. In term, India is a, has a large labor market. Japan has a shrinking labor market. Um, airports traditionally have been quite labor intensive. How is Japan dealing with a less labor intensive or approaching a less labor intensive airport system? Yes. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, Japan is facing the uh, possible uh, population decline. And uh, I understand that uh, uh, India has a huge uh, plenty of workforce. But uh, uh, we have to overcome the how to cope with the workforce shortage in Japan. And the solution for the workforce shortage in Japan is to introduce automation using IT and AI. For example, uh, please think about the airplane pushback operation by a towing tractor at the airport. At present, uh, four or five operators are involved with this operation. We plan to introduce the remote controlled equipment which can push airplane without tow bus in two years. This new method requires only one or two operators. In short, uh, this automation can contribute to save workforce dramatically. In addition, uh, reducing workforce in the maintenance and inspection work at the airport is another, another big challenge in Japan. To cope with that, we plan to introduce the advanced technology. For example, for the periodical runway check, three-dimensional laser measuring system will be used. This technology will contribute not only to save manpower, but also to recognize minor damage, which cannot be detected by conventional methods. It also contributes to predict deterioration of the runway more accurately. These were the typical examples to tackle workforce shortage in Japan. Well, unfortunately, the panel has come to the end of its allotted time. Um, I think we could probably spend most of the afternoon up here talking about it, but that wouldn't necessarily do justice to the, to the followers um, and to the, to the people who are about to present. So with that, I would ask you all to thank our panel and um, to congratulate me for getting done on time with the world's largest panel ever. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you, Honorable Moderator. <laughs> We're so sorry for cutting a session short by a few minutes, but uh, we have dignitaries arriving any moment now. Thank you very much to the esteemed panelists of this session. Thank you all. Please come together for a group photograph. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you all to remain seated, please. We will have a, a quick security scan of the hall, a very quick one. So I'd uh, require you all to be seated uh, in your places when that happens. Also, we have uh, winners uh, of the quiz. Uh, the winner of the quiz for Innovations for Green Aviation is uh, Haridas Mukul. 
The winner for the quiz on building a robust drone ecosystem is Sunil Rena and Mohit Gunja has won the quiz regarding connecting the world. You all can connect your prizes from the AAI counter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm going to uh, ask ma'am if she would. Uh... Thank you, sirs. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, I request you all to please settle down, take your seats, and please place on silent your mobile phones. Thank you. Thank you very much.